Good. Thank you. Uh, education and um, the gift of time are sort of where my questions are going to come from, my thoughts. And we have a couple of things that we've learned. We, it's complex. The day is long. And we greatly appreciate all of you being here today and giving of your time. Two of my uh, Senator colleagues talked about time and the possibility of a delay. One of my Senator colleagues, um, Senator Campbell, asked point blank, do you support legalization or not? And we've heard that answer. The, the part that I'm struggling with, and I think I've reflected about this an awful lot, is uh, absolutely right. We've had some form of drug education, drug strategies from public health to our schools for over three decades. It started off absolutely as the fear piece, as we do ter terrorize some of our the curriculum in saying, you know, don't take this. Hard work has been done since 1999, 2000 on trying to move it from that to that harm reduction, acknowledgement of what young people are doing. And across this country, some really good effort has been done there and sometimes, in co most times, in coordination with education and public health. These things take time. When we're looking at education and behavior changes as a result of education, as a result of learning, these things take time. We all know and are aware of behavior models. This is one, three, five years. We, the data we have out there on learning to converted behavior, I think, is, is evident for all of us. The, we, don't, we, we are talking about sharing information. We've got uh, you know, Health Canada documents that are very outdated for sure. We're still not sure of all the effects of TSC. We're still not sure of um, brain development. Information is continuing to come forward. So I'm coming at it again, even though I've heard it addressed today, that yes, if we delay, it does result in the criminalization versus decriminalization issue. But when we're looking at changes, measurable, purposeful changes in behavior, we're looking at trying to address all of our populations in Canada. We're looking at educations, and you talked about the cannabis talk kit. I have a second part of this. Is it in the best interest and the best bang for our buck to slow down this implementation? And I know we heard an answer once already this afternoon, but I take it from that education, learning, change behavior, what we don't know um, perspective. So I just wanted to take one more swing at that. Questions, Anybody so. who will respond. Oh, well, that will use up the yes. five minutes. Why don't we start with Dr. Jenkins then? Well, I, first of all, oh, at some point. Is that Dr. Jenkins? Uh, I called on Dr. Oh, sorry, Jenkins. Sorry. sorry. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, so I think in the 30 year history that you've mm -hmm. um, evidenced as um, uh, the current process, mm -hmm. we haven't seen that as being no. effective. Um, so I think the time really is now uh, mm -hmm. to make this change and it will take time for us to see any value, if mm -hmm. there is, to, uh, to, this exchange, to this change, which is an experiment. Mm -hmm. We haven't had it in our country before, mm -hmm. um, this policy. So, um, but I think it provides a real opportunity to be able to study the areas that we remain uncertain about um, with better access to cannabis. Um, it will provide better indications of what longer-term outcomes are. Um, and so I think um, we're ready. From a youth perspective, we already have a problem. We're the biggest consumer of cannabis in the world. So whether we regulate, legislate recreational cannabis, not going to change anything. I mean, the ones who can buy it now will, will be able to buy it legally, and the ones who won't be able to buy it legally are going to continue to buy it illegally. And that's not going to change. Unless we start creating a different attitude towards substances but cannabis and make them understand that uh, it's not a benign substance that there are some risk making some informed decisions getting the parents involved with the conversations with their kids and this talk kit is exactly what parents need to get I mean we're people are calling up uh, ordering these by the hundreds right now the uh, Yukon has just ordered 30,000 copies and want to distribute and the Northwest Territories are going to be distributing this in every household We'd like to encourage every province to do the same, so at least they have something that's that they can have in their hands that will be able to. It's you know it's evidence-based information to know what what is and what is right and wrong about cannabis and how to talk to your your child about it. But I think at this point, in terms of the time frame, you know, let's keep the regulations as tight as possible 
until we have better information. That's why our recommendation to have a moratorium on the marketing is just one example of this. That let's, you know, are we going to create a generation of potheads? We don't know. Nobody can say yes or no to this, but let's wait and see what this is going to do. It's going to take a whole generation to find out what the true societal impact is of this new legalization. Okay. I need to move on. Uh, uh, Senator Munson. Well, just to, to continue on that with um, Ms. Jenkins, uh, you talked about your trace program. I think we're talking around a, a lot of things right now. We talked about being things ineffective, as you said in, in your uh, opening statement, which I'm sorry I missed. Uh, but are, is it a national program of education that would fit all across the country? Because this is British Columbia, and... Uh, Specifically, I mean, if you can get into more of the, how that, how this would work uh, with education in a school again, a, a national program, because if you're seeing something, if provinces are putting something together, and you're seeing something in each province of what will hit home to both adult and child. Um, so I haven't proposed an education program per se, um, but we have done a study research. around um, research around how to engage young people in understanding evidence, making sense of evidence, learning how to read it and interpret it. Um, I think one-size-fits-all approaches are ineffective largely and don't work, and so I'm not sure that I would advocate for um, necessarily a... a Canada-wide uh, education program per se. Um, I think context is so important and that's why I advocate for us involving local populations and determining the content of the um, information and messaging approaches that would resonate with them. Um, and so I think that um, I think that educational resources such as the ones that um, uh, Mark Perry is here speaking about today are use, a useful starting place. I think we also need to do work with our marginalized communities who are experiencing um, significant um, and disproportionate levels of harms to understand what the specific needs are of those groups, as well as certain groups um, such as uh, um, parents who experience mental health problems or substance use disorders themselves and what types of needs they have around the education with their youth. Um, so, so to answer your question, I don't think a one-size-fits-all approach will work and it, it needs to be tailored to local context. Okay. Uh, I, I always ask this question at this committee, but, uh, you know, in the Senate, we, we like to make things better. We like to make legislation better, to make it work uh, for the country. Do any of you have an idea of amending this legislation it, just to, to make it better. I mean, as you said, the train has left the station. It's happening. It's going to be part of the landscape, and so be it. Let's move on. But are, are there ways that we can that we can enhance this legislation? Let's put it that way. Uh, well, I, anybody who cares sure. to, to look at it, I would appreciate it. Uh, I could continue to answer. Uh, yes, go ahead, and then I'll turn. go to Mr. Ferris. Uh, my, my concern just is around the, um, the potential that the current legislation has to continue to criminalize young people, um, both for possession and for um, sharing cannabis with friends. Um, and so I think we run the risk, um, as it currently stands, that um, those harms would still be disproportionately um, experienced by young people. Um, so I think that that should be looked at more closely. Well probably three wishes. First of all, there's still a lot of uh, discussion around drug-impaired driving and the, uh, the measurement of impairment, which is far, the science is far from proven yet. So that's one area that is of concern, and we're going to be having lots of people who have consumed cannabis who are going to be on our roads starting possibly this fall. Secondly, uh, edibles, which right now is not uh, a part of this legislation, but the government has indicated that they're going to review that in possibly a year from now. And that, to us, is bringing in a substance, whether it's gummy bears or muffins or whatever in the household. And that's a serious concern to us. And like I said, the third one, which is the marketing, if we could walk away from knowing that the government will commit to not opening up that Pandora's box for 10 years, then we feel we'd have done our job here today. And we'll go back to the, this end of the table. 
Yeah, I mean, I would mostly um, echo Dr. Jenkins' remarks around the criminalization of young people. I'm not sure if this is in the scope of the bill, but including some kind of amnesty or um, pardoning of convictions around cannabis-related arrests, I think, would be really important to kind of integrating more language around social justice in the Cannabis Act itself. I think that legalization should be thought of as a social justice issue as well, particularly with its disproportionate impact on, um, you know, uh, minority and indigenous um, Canadians. So I would, uh, you know, flag that as, as something that I think really could use a lot of um, improvement. Yes, um, as an indigenous person, I think that uh, our voice has been left out of this conversation quite a bit. So I think we need to um, include that voice. And I say that because I believe that solutions need to come from community. Right? I mean, it's hard to create a solution here at the Senate or in Ottawa or in Regina from our perspective in Saskatchewan. So I believe that those solutions need to be community driven and I agree with what everybody said, you know, that unless we actually take those solutions and we bring them and we support them and resource them from our communities, then we're going to struggle. So there's not going to be any sort of pan-Canadian answer to this, but I, I support what everybody else has said as well. Okay, now, uh, before I go to round two, uh, I'd just like to, for a second, uh, explore with Dr. Jenkins um, a little bit further the education, the, the way of getting uh, to youth, uh, to get a, help giving them an understanding of uh, the implications uh, and the kind, of, uh, the kind of evidence that would help them make a, an informed decision uh, for themselves uh, and, and do it in a way that the messaging would uh, resonate uh, with them. Um, you mentioned uh, in your opening remarks uh, that teachers uh, felt ill-equipped to talk to youth about cannabis, and it was in part because it's a gray zone not being uh, legal. Um, how much a part of that could the education, so this of course comes under provincial jurisdiction, the schools do, but uh, they do have the means to uh, be able to put part of their education dollars into that system and perhaps the federal government would be willing to help. How important is it uh, to, to have the teachers better equipped to, to deal with this matter or, as you say, uh, it's, it's really multidimensional, it's really not one size fits all, but I, I just want to get a sense of how important that particular part of it might be to you for the question. Um, the majority of our youth populations do attend school, so it's a great opportunity that we have to have uh, a audi captive audi audience, so to speak. Um, and the, the difficulties that teachers are experiencing within the legal gray zone is the fact that um, some of them have personal use themselves, um, but they're operating within a context where it is illegal for adults as well as young people, um, where they also are privy to the misinformation that is so widely um, available to, to our population. Um, and so I think this uh, legislation really provides the opportunity for us to um, educate, educate both youth and adults and those that are providing, and in, uh, providing care and interacting with youth. Um, so I think teachers uh, are an important target of the education that we can do, and by equipping them um, with resources to engage in open dialogue, it's not about having the right answer, so to speak, as much as being comfortable with engaging with the uncertainty that exists and um, creating a space uh, to dialogue about young people's experiences. Do you have any sense uh, that the provinces are engaging in that possibility. Uh, they, they do have some aspects of C45 under their control, both legislatively and also in terms of uh, policy and financial means. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any sense that any pro is there one province that is particularly uh, one or two provinces that are doing it well uh, that perhaps we should be looking at further? We are going to talk to provinces, mm -hmm. by the way, and I'd like to um, most idea. of my engagement has been um, more at the municipal level okay. um, or at, for, for example, at the school board level. Okay. Um, and so there, there is uh, absolutely efforts to better incorporate both substance use um, education and mental health education into our school system. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity here to um, dovetail with some of the mental health education that's happening um, and make sure that this enters into our curriculums. Um, 
I think the school recognizes the role that they have to play in um, providing that form of education to our young population. So um, I think it really, there's, there's an openness to so that. What about the uh, Medical Officer of Health for Canada? What about the, uh, what about our federal institution in terms of the educational factor? What role do you think mm -hmm. it could play? Well, I think um, in terms of broad public awareness campaigns, um, I think that there's an important role um, to play and then um, to perhaps working with province, provinces to find local solutions. Okay. I got one more minute in my time if anybody else has it. Mr. Osu. <laughs> um, as, a, as a teacher and an educator in my previous uh, life, um, but once a teacher, always a teacher is what we say, um, I believe that I, I agree with Dr. Jenkins that education is a key component to this and using uh, teachers in our school system because we do have that captive audience but there is a large proportion of these kids um, that we would miss if we just used the education system. Okay. There's a large number of kids that are absent, that are truant and a lot of those kids, you know, um, anecdotally speaking, are the kids that we're trying to target here. How do so we I get think, to them? How do well, we get and them? that's the thing, right? I mean, we need to find them where they're at. You know, and those are in youth centers, those are in Indian MAT friendship centers, those are in different places than in school. You know, they might attend school once or twice a week, and if you're lucky enough, that might be the day that they get that drug education or that cannabis education, but we need to find them and we need to meet them where they're at, and sometimes that's not school. And some of these are the most vulnerable kids and youth that we're looking to educate, and they're the ones that may be missing out if we just do it that way. So I think we need to find other avenues to educate them. Good point. And my time is up.